In this lecture, I am looking at art. As we progress, I will be looking at the techniques used by the artists, the history surrounding the art, the content and composition, as well as some of the symbols used to give art deeper implied meaning. As I do so, we will be using certain skills of observation, interpreting and evaluating the pictures, making association and comparison, referring to research, all the while keeping an open mind as to the content that we see. It is a lecture where we can begin to look and think critically. The tribute money is a multi-scene fresco painted by Masaccio. A Roman tax collector, the figure in the foreground in the short orange tunic, demands tax money from Christ and the twelve apostles, who don't have the money to pay. Peter is told by Christ to go to the lake, catch the first fish, open its mouth and you will find a four drachma coin. Use that coin to pay the tax. In the centre of the fresco, we see the tax collector demanding the money. On the far left, we see Peter kneeling down, retrieving the money from the mouth of a fish. And on the far right, Peter pays the tax collector. In the fresco, the tax collector appears twice, and Peter appears three times. You can find them easily if you look for their clothing. But which one is Christ? One point perspective is used to indicate the position of Christ. The painting shows Giovanni de Nicolao Arnolfini, a merchant from Bruges, and his bride, Costanza Trenta, who he married in 1426. The perspective indicates the mirror as if this is somehow important. Mirrors were a rare domestic item, and only the privileged few were able to see their own faces. Arnolfini has his right hand raised, perhaps as a greeting. Let's look at some of the elements that make this painting fascinating. First of all, the dog. The dog is a Brussels griffon. It is a rare breed and a sign of wealth. It represents fidelity. In the bottom left and lying on the floor are sandals. These are the one really fashionable element of the woman's ensemble. They were typically removed as a sign of respect. Dyed leather was a luxury, and the dark colour of the leather was the hardest to achieve. If you look closely, you can see that the sandals have shiny brass studs, which means that these sandals must have been very expensive. It makes them a status symbol as prized as Louboutins are today. Both Giovanni and Costanza wear clothes that made Bruges the centre of a trading empire. Fur, silk, wool, linen, leather and gold. The wife's gown has astonishing dimensions. A replica of her dress made in 1997 required 35 meters of material. It is lined with squirrel fur, perhaps as many as 2,000 skins. The most prestigious fur was sable, and it was reserved for royalty and aristocracy. The husband is wearing what is called a tabard. It is lined with the second most prestigious fur, pine marten. Its plum colour is another statement of wealth, because as we saw with the sandals, dark dye was more expensive to produce. On the left of the picture are oranges. 
Oranges were a rare delicacy in Northern Europe and were imported from the South. They were prized for their culinary properties, making the dull Flemish food so much more tasty. Doctors recommended that oranges be eaten also as protection from the plague. They were included in the painting because oranges were also a symbol of love and marriage. William Allman Hunt was a member of the Pre-Raphaelites. The Pre-Raphaelites was a mid-19th century group of English artists and poets. Here we see a gentleman and his mistress in a house for their meetings. Have you noticed that she's not wearing a wedding ring? As they play and sing to Thomas More's Oft in the Stilly Night, she has a sudden spiritual revelation. As she rises from her lover's lap, she gazes into the sunlit garden beyond. Can you see it? It is reflected in the mirror behind her. This garden image represents the woman's lost innocence and saves her from sin. It is indicated by the ray of light in the foreground, in the bottom right near the man's foot. In the painting there are other symbolic elements. There is a cat playing with the bird under the table. This symbolizes the woman's plight. In other words, the dangerous moral situation the woman finds herself in. The wool on the floor symbolizes the web of deception in which the girl is trapped. When the Derby Day was first exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1858, it proved so popular that a barrier had to be put up to keep back the crowds. There are three main incidents. On the far left, next to the Reform Club's private tent, a group of men in top hats focus on the gambling game. The thimble rigger, with his table, is inviting the audience to participate in the game. The man taking a note from his pocket is the trickster's accomplice. He is tempting the rustic looking man in a smock whose wife is trying to restrain him. On the right of this group another man with his hands in his pockets has had his gold watch stolen by the man behind. In the center of the picture we see an acrobat and his son who looks longingly over at a sumptuous picnic being laid out by a footman. Behind them are carriages, including a courtesan on the far right, who is the kept mistress of the character leaning against the carriage. He is better known as a dandy. As the dandy leans against the carriage, the mother of the courtesan is quietly speaking to her daughter, perhaps asking her for money. While this goes on, the queen is watching the racing from the grandstand in the background. The ship in this picture is called Her Majesty's Ship Temeraire. It was built in 1798. She played a distinguished role in the Battle of Trafalgar. Clarkson Frederick Stanfield was regarded as the greatest marine artist of his day. The Battle of Trafalgar depicts the battle between the British Royal Navy and the fleets of France and Spain during the Napoleonic Wars. The battle took place on the 21st of October 1805 at Cape Trafalgar off the southwestern coast of Spain. The ultimate aim in battle was to lock ships together and capture the enemy by boarding. The crew of the French ship Redoubtable 
boarded Admiral Nelson's ship Victory and during the fight Nelson was killed. The Temeraire came to the rescue and fought so bravely that the French and Spanish fleets were defeated. This was painted in 1839. It is by Turner, one of the greatest painters of the age. After her brave performance at Trafalgar, we see the Temeraire being pulled to her grave by the new kid on the block, the new technology, the steam engine. The composition of this painting is unusual in that the most significant object, the old warship, is positioned well to the left of the painting within a triangle of blue sky. The quiet beauty of the old ship is in contrast to the dirty, blackened, noisy tugboat. The tugboat pulls the Temeraire past a small river craft, which gives an indication of a faster speed. On the opposite side of the painting, the setting sun symbolizes the end of an era in the history of the British Royal Navy. It is the passing of a glorious age. It is symbolic of the old handing over to a new, younger generation. Chiaroscuro is the name given to the use of strong contrasts between light and dark. It is a technique that gives a sense of volume and solidness in three-dimensional objects and figures, and adds realism to paintings. Here it is being used to full effect by Caravaggio. The painting was originally an altarpiece. Today it can be seen in the Vatican Pinacoteca. The upper half of Christ's body is that of a muscular labourer being held by John the Evangelist, the man in the red cloak. The lower half is supported by Saint Nicodemus, who traditionally removed the nails from Christ's feet on the cross. The composition is revolutionary. It is a diagonal of mourners for the limp, dead Christ and the bare stone that will be his tomb. It is a naturalist approach involving realistic images of Christ and the Virgin Mary, which marked a fundamental change from the more idealistic religious painting. The Virgin Mary is normally seen as a young woman, but here she is old. In the bottom left of the painting is a plant, a moulin, believed to possess medicinal properties to ward off evil spirits. It symbolizes the coming resurrection and the triumph over death. The girl highlighted is the daughter of King Philip IV of Spain. She is the Infanta Margaret Teresa wearing fashion typical of the time. This slide shows the hoop and how it was used to extend the hips. The mask was used by ladies to wear in front of the face when outside. This prevented the lady from getting a suntan. For a lady to have a suntan meant that she worked outside and this would have been unacceptable to court society. I came across this while doing my research into the painting. James Laver was the curator in charge of fashion at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. I've included this as an interesting way to show how fashion is considered as it develops and passes. This law could easily be applied to other creative areas. From the point of view of the fashion designer, knowing what is going to be in fashion is critical. I've highlighted what could be called the sweet spot, and being acutely aware of this is the fundamental focus of the best designers. Las Meninas was painted in 1656 by Diego Velazquez. The painting's composition is very elaborate and challenges the perceptions of illusions and reality 
as well as the status and involvement of the subjects and the audience. The painting is set in the Royal Palace in Madrid. The foreground contains one of the focuses of the painting, the Infanta Margarita. She is the five-year-old princess and the daughter of the Spanish king, Philippe IV, and his wife, Mariana. The princess is being assisted by two ladies-in-waiting, or maids. To the right of the princess stand two dwarves and a dog. Behind them you can find Margarita Chaperon and a bodyguard. Velasquez the artist is on the left-hand side of the painting, standing at an easel. The red cross on his chest signifies that he was a member of the Order of Santiago which is the same as a knighthood in the UK. As there is so much going on in the painting, it is unclear who the real subject is. However, the perspective indicates that it is the king and queen who are being painted by Velasquez. You can see their reflection in the mirror on the back wall. They have been instructed by the artist to focus upon the hand of the man in the doorway. Pointillism is a technique using small dots of paint to form an image. Televisions and computer monitors employ a similar technique today, except only three colours are used. Red, green and blue. Pointillism was developed in 1886 as an extension to Impressionism and relies upon the ability of the eye to blend coloured spots into a fuller range of tones. The painting represents a group of Parisians at leisure on the bank of the River Seine. The figures look very mechanical and static. Many see this as the artist's interpretation of the artificiality of modern Paris at that time. Some of these robotic characters are doing curious things. One such example is the couple on the right. They are highlighted by the lines of the bridge and the edge of the river. The woman is holding a monkey on a leash. The word for small monkey in French is saint -Gesse. In the Parisian slang of the time, this would mean prostitute. On the face of it, this is a picture of a tranquil Sunday afternoon. But if you look for the clues, a more informed picture of Parisian life in the late 19th century emerges. Beneath a boiling yellow, orange and red sky, a figure stands upon a bridge. He is wearing a blue coat, which appears to flow into the aqua, indigo and ultramarine water behind him. He holds up two elongated hands on either side of his hairless, skull-like head. His eyes are wide with shock, and he unleashes a terrifying shriek. The only sense of normality and saviour are the two figures and the far-off boat in the fjord. The two figures upon the bridge anchor normality to a horrific scene. But if they are removed, the picture becomes even more horrific, from which there is no escape, no people to turn to, no help to stop the madness. It is too awful to bear. This is what Monk wrote in 1889. He was ahead of his time. Ten years later, in 1899, the interpretation of dreams by Sigmund Freud was published. Even though the book did not sell immediately, it had an enormous influence, and psychology was now part of the language of art. This painting is actually a screen print composed of multiple images of Marilyn Monroe. On the left, in full colour, she is at her peak. 
the repeated image of her in everyone's living room on TV. International fame, a global celebrity, the golden age of American marketing. On the right, in faded black and white, the price of fame, drugs, overdose, and early death. This is to show the first indications of the effect of globalization. But how can the negative effects of globalization be portrayed effectively? Sometimes conventional materials such as paintbrush and paint aren't enough. It is best to physically demonstrate the damage, in this case by walking up and down repeatedly in a field. This is the eroding effect of mass tourism. In the space age we can now witness global damage firsthand. Seeing the planet in the vastness of space only serves to highlight its delicate balance and vulnerability. The jetty is situated on the northeast shore of Great Salt Lake in America. Like the Great Wall of China, this man-made structure is visible from space. Before the development of sharp satellite technology, the jetty was a testament that if the ecology of the Earth is altered, the widespread effect of destruction can now be recorded on a global scale. This enormous sculpture measures just over five meters in length. It captures a newly delivered baby in its first glimpse of the surrounding world. In creating this gigantic newborn baby, Mueck uses scale as an expressive device to enhance the trauma and the miracle of birth. In her first stretch, the baby clenches fists and toes. The umbilical cord, which once supplied her with life, hangs limply. The squashed and battered body is smeared with traces of blood and reveals the reality of the ordeal which we have all experienced, but we do not remember. The sculpture stimulates emotions and encourages to consider the human body anew. Looking for a society more simple and elemental than that of his native France, Gauguin left for Tahiti in 1891. In the way of many languages, the painting should be read from right to left. The three women on the right with a child represent the beginning of life. The middle group symbolize the daily existence of young adulthood. The final group on the left shows an old woman approaching death. She appears alone with her thoughts. The bird at her feet represents the futility of words. The blue idol in the background represents the beyond. On a more fundamental level, the painting is asking, where does humanity come from? Where is it going? How does humanity proceed? A thousand years is still extremely powerful and still surprising. It is clean and dirty, full of life and death, and shocking in its brutal finality. The glass vitrine has a clean and minimal geometry which offsets the stench of birth, death and decay inside. It consists of an enclosed glass vitrine bisected at the midway point with a glass sheet that has been pierced with a few round holes. Maggots hatch inside a white box. From this they turn into flies and feed on a bloody severed cow's head lying on the floor. Within the enclosed sculpture, flies circle around 
and some hit the insectocutor and die. Others survive and continue the cycle. Hours can be spent observing the flies, going about their business with what appears to be the utmost freedom. But in fact, it is a freedom totally constrained by an inevitable ending zap. As I have mentioned in previous slides, sometimes paint isn't the best medium to express. Untitled Perfect Lovers is an installation of two identical battery operated clocks, synchronized and hanging side by side. The clocks is a work with multiple possible meanings. However, the abstract nature of the clock's substitution for bodies allows it to be read generally as a metaphor for love. The instructions from the artist require that commercial clocks to be of the exact dimensions and design. They must touch with the hands set to exactly the same time. This painting depicts a scene in which humans, animals and objects offer literal illustrations of the Dutch language and its proverbs and idioms. Proverbs were very popular in Bruegel's time. You may wish to count them, but there are approximately 112 identifiable proverbs and idioms in this painting, and some of these are still in popular use today. To give you an example, I've highlighted two areas of the painting. The two areas of the painting I've highlighted give you four examples. It may be that you have the same proverbs and idioms in your language, even though they may be expressed in a different way. The 3rd of May 1808 is a painting completed in 1814 by the Spanish painter Francisco Goya. It is a remarkable painting in many ways. Let's begin by looking at the historical context. Napoleon I of France had crowned himself emperor in 1804. At this time Spain controlled access to the Mediterranean, therefore the country was politically and strategically important to French interests. The reigning Spanish king, Carlos IV, was internationally regarded as weak. Napoleon took advantage of the weak king by suggesting the two nations conquer and divide Portugal, and Napoleon travelled to Spain to meet with Carlos IV. However, the King of Spain was so ineffective that he failed to understand Napoleon's true intention, which was to invade Spain and the whole peninsula. What follows was an invasion of mass murder and executions. The horror of war is recorded in this bloody scene. Let's look at the form. Notice the contrast. On the left, a disorganized group of captives held at gunpoint. On the right, an organized firing squad. A square lamp is situated on the ground between the two groups and this adds a dramatic contrast of light to the scene. Goya cleverly uses the rifles of the soldiers to visually connect the right side of the painting with the left. This adds force to the impending fate of the defenseless victims. Madrid is set in the background and the line of the buildings together with the tower 
further separates the two different groups. The content, presentation and emotional force of this painting makes it a groundbreaking image of the horrors of war. It is the beginning of photojournalism and is one of the first paintings of the modern era. I am now going to return to an artist that I have mentioned before in this presentation, Turner. First, I should mention that in the time of Turner, the original Royal Academy was in Somerset House on the Strand in London. The intellectual world was much smaller at this time, and so the Royal Academy of Artists shared the same building with the Royal Society of Scientists. In the early 1800s, there was no great divide between art and science like there is today. This meant that artists and scientists could easily meet and discuss the same ideas. It could be that on one side of the wall there might be painters having dinner, while two rooms down the corridor there might be a scientist giving a lecture. At this time many new discoveries were being made in science. It was an age of enlightenment. One example of scientific research was by William Herschel. From 1779 Herschel had been regularly observing the sun, especially sunspots and solar activity. In 1801 Herschel reported his findings to the Royal Society. This is an extract from a paper published in 1794. I've highlighted some of the key observations. This form of description was revolutionary at the time. Turner's paintings are a catalogue of scientific progress. Through conversations between scientists and artists, Turner would have been at the forefront of scientific discovery, fascinated at the findings. This had a profound effect on the way he painted. One such example is in this painting. I am not going to talk about the painting, but concentrate on the sun. Let's have a look at a close-up. This is Turner's representation of surface inequality, mottled spots, unevenness, protuberances, bumps and bright spots. Another example of how science was influencing art was Michael Faraday. He was one of the most prolific scientists of the 19th century and is best known for his discoveries on electromagnetic induction, the electric motor and electrolysis. This is an image of iron filings around a magnet. This kind of image would have been a revelation to Turner. Let's look at another of his paintings. Is this a physical manifestation of unseen forces? Underneath the chaos there is a regularity. This is a new way of painting, a new visual language to show the Earth's hidden strength. The ship is a focus of all the massive energy, a visual metaphor to express the overwhelming power of nature. Here we can see the movement of iron filings as a magnet is moved. This image is indicative of the power of the Earth's magnetism. Underneath what seems like chaos there is real regularity. In his paintings Turner is not trying to explain the Earth's magnetism, 
but he's trying to express what this power is. When we look at the movement of iron filings around a magnet, we are looking at a visual metaphor. And by looking at magnetic movements such as this, Turner had found a new way of expression. It helped him to create a visual language that expressed nature's hidden forces. He realized his painting should possess the same rhythm. The vast invisible power of the Earth's magnetism. This is what Turner was trying to capture in this painting. I'm not going to comment on this painting, except to mention that it was painted by Carmen Ferrara. She is 103 years old. She was born in Cuba, but spent most of her life in America. She was only discovered at the age of 89. Even though she was creating the same work as her male contemporaries, it was only the men who were given exhibitions. While your life as a student may seem extremely difficult at times, your perseverance and persistence will be rewarded. I've included this picture of a bird to get your attention, because now it's your turn to look at art. Notice the name of the bird. Nighthawks is the title of this painting by Edward Hopper. Look at the arrangement, the lights, the darks, the horizontal and vertical lines. Ask yourself some questions. The place. What country is this? The people. Where are they? What are they doing? What are they saying? The fashion. What clothes are they wearing? Think about the date. What was happening at the time? What do you think is the context surrounding this painting? Ask yourself about your emotions. How do you feel when you look at the painting? And what is it within the painting that makes you feel those emotions? Here is another painting, this time an interior. The people are younger. Who are they? What are they doing? What are they thinking? Look at the title. What is the box? Look at the angles and lines. How are they related? How do they connect objects and people? What do you imagine the context of this painting is? What evidence is there within the painting that gives you the answer to these questions? All responses to works of art are conditioned by our different personal and social experiences. These cannot be ignored and should be your starting point when thinking about an artwork. Each artwork should be looked at in terms of what it is telling you. This could be through its content, its title, or the type of work it is. Every work of art has its own qualities, and these will inform your reading of it. To understand these qualities, you need to look at the artwork formally, for example, in terms of line, tone, colour, and space. Equally, if you are aware of the physical properties, such as the materials and the processes used by the artist, these will deepen your understanding of the work of art. The following slides will try to illustrate my thinking as I look at a work of art. Use them as a guide to help you critically analyse the two paintings by Edward Hopper and Bo Bartlett. By using these ideas, hopefully, it will lead you to analyse and evaluate your own subject and allow you to access a deeper understanding of the histories and associations of the work you do at the University.